to another academic video brought to you by the academic and research team of Malaysian Dental Student Association. So today we'll be commencing our first ever CBM, Case-Based Learning with Expert at Curly Dental. So joining us today will be Dr. Sonia Lee, the leading practitioner of this video. Dr. Sonia Lee graduated from the National University of Singapore with a master's degree in this So head, she's the person of this health today. So come, let's go meet the doctor. Sonia, thank you so much for having us today. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> we're very, very glad to have you kickstart our first CBL uh, session with us. So, how are you feeling today, Doctor? I'm oh, feeling great. Great. It's mm -hmm. nice to see though my uh, fellow juniors from PIDC. And, uh, I've, I've graduated for quite some time. But it's definitely nice to see new faces. <laughs> Enthusiastic ones. I hope I look enthusiastic enough. Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> All right. So, uh, before we dive into the gist of our topic, uh, Doctor, do you mind sharing with us a bit of your journey, or more like what sparked your interest in prosthodontics, and uh, what, how, who exactly, or what were you inspired by to join prosthodontics? Right. right. So, if we were to look at the definition of prosthodontics based on the glossary, um, the ninth edition. If the term prosthetic actually governs the fact that there is things like diagnosis, treatment planning, rehabilitation, and maintenance of oral health, function, comfort, and also appearance. So with all of that, I was very much intrigued with the whole treatment process since um, undergrad days. Mm -hmm. So you know we have OMOP, right? And we go through the whole END and everything. So I always felt that was very interesting because it kind of guides you to think about what are the various kind of indication, considerations to formulate a treatment plan. So with all of that, I also was very, I also found prosthetic work, means the prosthetic lab, mm -hmm. to be relatively therapeutic in terms of what like wax up, denture flasking and all of that. So it, it really got me into prosthodontics. But of course, I would say, you know, as a young adult, you know, still very immature, I would say I'm not matured fully, I'm still growing, I'm still constantly learning day in, day out. Um, it was between endo, perio, but pros was definitely something that I was very into. Um, and then what happened was, during my final year of dental school, I was, I was doing END one day and then I realised, you know what, I felt that my treatment options for my patients are very limited because it's based on what I know. So I enrolled myself in a mini residency program in Plan. And a lot of people thought I was crazy, but you know, I, I was like, no, I really wanted to not restrict my patient's uh, options in terms of treatment planning. So I went ahead with it. And then after I've graduated, I went for multiple courses because there were too much of gaps. I felt that I really needed, I wanted to know more. Mm. So I paid for, I mean, I got myself into courses and everything. The one, the one turning point was there was this particular um, lecture series. It was a Lions meeting, I think back in 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, the speakers actually was uh, Dr. Wong Ken Man, who was a very well-respected prosthodontist from Singapore, Grandview, Washington U, mm -hmm. as well as Dr. Alvin Leong. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the panel was also Dr. Ang Chi Wan, who was a perio, and Dr. Bruce Lee. So when I listened to them speak, I was so I was so amazed, also inspired by the depth of knowledge to which they were able to grasp and shared with us. So that was like, that's what I want to do. And that's how it got me to decide that I'm going to pursue my specialization in prosthodontics in NUS specifically. So, you know, there's a Malay proverb, right? It calls, Bagamana Acham Begitu Lako Hinyo. So that's basically the whole story of it. And that's how I ended up here. That is actually very, very inspiring to hear about. I did not see that coming, to be very honest. <laughs> I don't really find prosthodontics my favorite subject right. at the moment. But guys, uh, keep trimming because for all you know, if you like prosto, you might turn out to be exactly like who Dr. Sonia is. So continue pursuing all the But of course, um, you can develop your love midway through your career, you know? It doesn't mean that you will develop a little spark, mm -hmm. you know? First love may not necessarily be your true love. Thanks, <laughs> <Yes, laughs> guys. <laughs> so, a little tip. Ah, okay, right. So, I've been following bits and pieces of your work and it really does reflect your enthusiasm and your passion to this field. So, for everyone out there, please 
Ada kata bukan maksudnya. <laughs> okay, so um, speaking of quality work, so we'll dive right into the cases. So I heard, Doctor, you have two cases that you're going to share with our audience. Well. Yeah, so um, these are two interesting cases of which they have very similar presentation, mm-hmm. but both executed executed differently because based on various consideration and indication. So I will try to be as detailed as possible but with the time constraints I hope it's also beneficial that you know you get a take home there are take home messages and lesson learned. So for both of these cases, they are both aesthetic cases and they all have missing teeth, which is a missing anterior teeth. The small line in these cases also play a very critical role in how I decide the treatment plan ultimately. Mm-hmm. Tooth proportion which is a very big thing, especially in aesthetics, you know, yes. I mean, you, you try to balance out how a teeth should be, whether it's part of the golden proportion, is it rotated or not. So um, I would talk a little bit about how I plan the case and how I achieve the desired aesthetic outcome, followed by, you know, anterior case, often patients are very demanding. Mm-hmm. So let's see how we can tackle this and how we are able to de- that to actually uh, deliver what is actually doable. Right. So. Wow, well, let's look at this. Honestly, aesthetic case can definitely be very challenging, but it also can be very stressful to a point that you can lose sleep over it over time. And, 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 and if provided that the case goes well, it is very rewarding yes. because rewarding the patient feels great. You know, you get to change someone's life in a way. So this case, of course, involves a multidisciplinary teamwork, which involves the prosthodontist or restorative dentist, uh, the periodontist, and the last part or the last puzzle to, to, to complete this is actually patient. Oh. If the patient doesn't get involved in the treatment plan, does not feel part of it, you will often see a failure to the case because they need to own up, they need to be responsible to it. So like I said, this is a teamwork, not just the dentist, but the patient involved as well. Okay. So let's look at case one. I'll go through it based on three simple steps. So the first step is basically um, initial assessment and analysis, then are followed by execution from a surgical point of view and from a prosthetic point of view. Then last but not least is the delivery of the prosthesis. Mm-hmm. So if you look at case one, um, this patient basically was referred to me to restore tooth number 21 and 22, which is the left, maxillary left central and lateral incisors. So he actually lost these tooth due to trauma long back. And he's been wearing a partial denture since, so you know, office people want to change in their life and all. Mm-hmm. So there are a few parameters which I look at, but of course there are many, many criteria. Um, what I use acronym as BAT PFMs. B means what? You have biomechanical risk, mm-hmm. aesthetic risk for A. D means um, dental facial considerations. P, which is the periodontal risk. F, which is functional risk. And then M, medical conditions, because patients come with either they are taking bisphosphonates or anything that can significantly change the cost of treatment. And the last thing that people always forget is cost. Cost is very important. You can give the most ideal treatment, but ultimately, you know, the patient is unable to pay, you know. It will also affect their welfare as well, right? It's true. So what I mean by biomechanical risk example, the pro- the material of the prosthesis. Mm-hmm which is whether you're using an all ceramic materials or if you're going to use a PFM, so that is biomechanical. Aesthetics, we know patient expectations. Proportions, colour. Mm-hmm. When I talk about dental facial consideration, like what? Patient smile line, the lip support and all of that. So anything that is dental facial. Right, then functional risks are like what? Occlusion. Um, existing dentition means is there sufficient teeth behind to support the whole processes. Para function habits, you know, patient biting on peanuts or whatever. So those are things that we need to look at. Okay. So for case number one, based on these few acronyms of consideration, the aesthetic risk for this patient was relatively moderate. Now I understand the small line is slow, but moderate is because the patient has some kind of demand. So that makes the case a little bit more complicated or complex in many ways. Mm-hmm. Functional risk. Now, if you look carefully at the pictures, right, you can definitely see there's some kind of craze line on the mandibular anterior okay. and some incisor notching, yes. which suggests there might be some wear, parafunctional wear, I don't know. So further investigation and thorough um, examination of the patient and through ENT is necessary. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so if we assess the smile line, right, the upper smile line of this patient 
would be considered low because it is at the mid of the tooth does not expose the papilla so that is called a low smile line which is very favorable for aesthetics right yes. and also another thing to observe is there's a lack of lip support on the upper left lip mm -hmm. so there's a collapse at the edentulous area mm -hmm. that also tells us that the position of the teeth will play a significant role into re providing the support back to that lip to enhance the aesthetics again, right? So, despite the patient's demands for aesthetics, of course, it can be slightly less complex in many ways for this case because the transition line is actually way beyond or way epical from the small line of this patient. What do you mean by transition line? Transition line is basically the junction between your prosthesis mm -hmm. and your gum line from the residual ridge. So if you can hide all the transition away from the smile, like even the patient smiles as wide as possible, you can't see that junction. Right. So another way to analyze a case of how complex it is, right? Now, I did a simple digital designing based on golden proportions. I mean, of course, these are based on guide to help me to decide um, truly what is necessary for this uh, patient, what kind of tooth shape and all. Mm -hmm. So it gives me an idea. It helps me in my wax up planning. So, um, at the end of the day, proportions and all, there are various considerations, correct? Mm -hmm. There's a classic paper you all can read, it's called Frush and Fisher um, in 1957. They talk about the dentogenic concept. So where, what dental concept is, of course, they based on three vital factors, which is sex, personality and age of a patient, different shape, how it affects, right? Mm -hmm. And also the dynastatic, which is based on tooth and its position. So if you have time, just go and look through the paper. Although it's based on a complete denture setup, but it doesn't matter because there are vital criteria of how a tooth is selected for a particular case. So at the end of the day for this case, a single implant placement was indicated uh, instead of two. I mean, I understand there are two missing teeth, but need not necessarily every tooth have to be replaced. Okay. So what was the consideration was we took a CBCT to evaluate the underlying bone because the most important thing to hold an implant is of course the yes. bone, right? So knowing that the defect was so large and after talking to the patient that he would require extensive heart tissue augmentation, mm -hmm. which is guided bone regeneration, yes. the patient decided, you know, I don't want to go through all of that. Yes. Let's just go ahead with just some soft tissue augmentation to just correct the contours. Okay. So with that, a single implant was indicated because the tooth side of 2-1 had sufficient bone mm -hmm. and what other things that we considered as I mentioned based on the you know the acronyms that I had earlier the patient has had a very good dentition where he had sufficient posterior support mm -hmm. when we talk about posterior support means the back teeth so back teeth are meant to protect the front teeth mm -hmm. the front teeth are meant to protect the back teeth so we some, sometimes we call it as mutually protected mm -hmm. occlusion and then there's also favorable occlusion in this case and good guidance control mm -hmm. so that makes it very biomechanically and also functionally favorable to have a cantilever in this case. So with that, this is the before picture and then this is how I restored the patient ultimately with a single unit FDP with a cantilever I see. implant process. So your choice of a cantilever is used in this case. Are there any, uh, in general, are there any contraindications to a cantilever? Yes, definitely. I mean, all things aside, right, there are things that are possible and, and then not all things are doable, right? Yes. So to understand what are the contraindications, you have to know what are your parameters of indication first. Yes. Correct? Correct. So if based on those acronyms, like example, in this case, like I mentioned, in terms of uh, functional risk, mm -hmm. the patient has very good occlusion control and guidance. So definitely it's not a contraindication. Okay. Example of a contra is that when the patient has no back teeth, but mainly front teeth just chewing. Okay. So you can imagine all the functional load will be on the anterior teeth. Okay. Then there will be overloading on the on the cantilever or the pontic, mm -hmm. which is unfavorable. Okay. For example, when you have black patients with deep bite, mm -hmm. you know you sometimes have no space, right? And this no space is called as restorative space. When there's lack of restorative space, and you're gonna consider example an all ceramic restoration. So an all ceramic restoration, you would need what? Material thickness, right? Yes. Because they are relatively brittle yes. anyways. So imagine no space, lack of material thickness equals to increased risk of catastrophic failure. So these are the considerations to think about based on those simple acronyms that I, I, I was sharing. Earlier. So uh, that's this the case is how we started off with and that is how I restored the case. So if you see that 
not only the incisor line, I managed to harmonize it, I also gave back the patient the lip support which mm -hmm. he was lacking of. So ultimately, in this case, it was a favorable outcome and yeah, with the low small line, I, I kind of run away with a lot of things. <laughs> Okay. And, um, well, so I, I, uh, before that, I actually have a question. Uh, you mentioned that the patient has actually a relatively lower small line. Yes. Uh, and the black triangle present there, if it's acceptable for patient, are there any? Did you actually uh, provide um, advice on how to clean it or maintain the hygiene? Yeah. So black triangles. I know a lot of us will say, "Oh, black triangle is so unaesthetic." Um, it's terrible and I should close it up. So, a lot of times, black triangle is not necessarily bad or anything. Most important is we do not violate biology. Because at the end of the day, whatever you do, right, if you violate biology, biology will win. So you need to design a prosthesis, keeping in mind, right, that it's cleansable. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, you can do so many things. You know, I've seen prosthesis which is over contoured, mm -hmm. trying to close out the black triangle. But you compromise biology which is not feasible. So in the end day, a prosthesis design has to be a flexible design, especially at the embrasure. And the contours has to be very favorable so that it's not plug retentive. So one of the guides that I usually use when I design my prosthesis is my patients are able to place an interproximal brush and in the at the embrasure areas. Oh. This shows that the prosthesis is cleansable, mm -hmm. right? If you can't, then it's very difficult. Of course, yes. you have to choose the right size. Right. So a lot of times people don't know that interbreath brushes have many many sizes. So you need to choose use the right gauge to choose the right size for the patient. Mm -hmm. So yeah. your go-to advice for patients with these uh, uh, black triangles is to actually use an interdental brush. Yes, yes. Or either a water flosser, but to me mechanical cleaning is more efficient than anything else. Alright, yeah. okay. Uh, I have another question regarding your in this case. So if a patient were to come with a higher small line, Will this treatment differ in any way? In this case, honestly, it wouldn't differ much. I mean, if, of course, based on the criteria that mm -hmm. I have. I, I would treat every case as a high smile case. Of course, there are some maybe considerations to take on, but ultimately, it is knowing my patient expectation. That's why I cannot emphasize on the importance of a thorough and comprehensive examination mm -hmm. and getting to know your patients. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what, what do they expect at the end of the day? Ideally, least you do not want to promise the moon, right? So once you lower the patient's expectation, things get a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. You know, you can control the case as much as possible. Complications are bound to arise. Correct. It's beyond our control sometimes, you know? Example, if we were to do a soft tissue grafting on right side of the patient and then we do on the left, the outcome may be different even though the steps is done by the same person mm -hmm. and everything because Biology and, and healing all varies with time, so I would say it doesn't change much. Okay. Okay. So, doctor, can we proceed to the next? Sure. So, okay. the second case is um, a very challenging case, I would say. Mm -hmm. So, when you look at it at first glance, right, the patient looks like this patient is definitely a parasitical patient. You can definitely super eruption, bone loss, ultimately compromising the aesthetics. Mm -hmm. So, it already rings some bell, right? Again, I'll bring everyone through these three simple steps on how I restore this case. First one is basically the initial assessment and analysis. Second is execution, whether it's surgical or prosthetic. And then the last one is delivery of the prosthesis. So if we move on to the examination of the case based on those acronym bad PFMs. Yes. Okay, so aesthetic risk is red. Because the small line is very high, exposing beyond the transition line, yeah. you know, as I explained earlier. The patient's aesthetic risk is very high because why? The patient's demand is there. Okay? From a dental facial consideration, high smile line, uneven zenith, so hard to control in terms of the proportions as well. Not only that, the teeth as well. You know, you have got certain edentulous space. You need to kind of reorganize this space to achieve the ideal golden proportions. Correct. So periodontal risk is also red. Why? She's a non pero patient. So you know you have definitely three rates as to compare to the previous case, it's just two yellow. So you already know what you're going to work on, right? right. Um, hopefully you don't lose sleep. La. So the small line as I analyze it, you can definitely see it's mm -hmm. way beyond the transition line, which makes things a bit more complicated. So when the patient smiles and you have a prosthesis, you can definitely 
if it's not done well or planned well, you can definitely see the gap or the transition. So that's why we call transition line, right? So those are things to consider also. Then you have the tooth proportion which you have to plan, right? So I plan my tooth proportion um, based also off the small curve. This small curve helps me to determine where the incisal edge of the tooth should be. Mm -hmm. So with that, that's how I did my digital planning. And I decided to go ahead with a square shaped teeth for this patient based on his profile, like I said, based on fresh nutrition, dentogenic concept. So with all of that, as a guide, an aesthetic guide, which is useful. So moving on to the face, if you can see, parachatting is very important for para patients. <laughs> you want to know whether they are committed to the treatment plan, yes, correct? That's true. Like I said, it's a multi display approach. Yes. And true enough, patient came in with a 67 bleeding or probing. So you know, 7% is very high, huh? So after treatment, putting the patient through SPT, SPT is supportive periodontal therapy, which is scaling and all of that. After 10 months, I mean, or 10 months into the treatment, there was improvement and the bleeding score was only 10%. Mm -hmm. We show that this patient is really committed. Yes. With that, I know my treatment plan will be more predictable in many ways, and my patient understands the treatments that we are going to do for him. Mm -hmm. So for this case, I mean, in looking at the OPG, you can definitely see many things, bone levels, and it helps you to plan things. So my consideration for this case, of course, when it comes to treatment planning, um, is either whether to do an implant or whether to do a three unit FTP, right? Mm -hmm. So the consideration was looking at the existing bone level. So if we look at the bone level, there is um, a step. So there is definitely a defect on 2-1, which is very much apical compared to 2-1-1. So if I were to consider placing an implant, the implant is going to be way apical compared to two uh, to one one. Yes. This is going to be an aesthetic nightmare, <laughs> a nightmare. So, <laughs> and I'm going to create more black triangle in this yeah. case. So, implant in this case would definitely not be very favorable, mm -hmm. right? And another consideration is the adjacent teeth. If you see the adjacent teeth are all crowns, and the OPG shows that he has good bone levels, means good periodontal support, mm -hmm. which is good. Right? And it so has no mobility. Another thing is that they are all crowned, so it means I can redistribute the space again to kind of get the most ideal uh, aesthetic outcome as possible. So all of this consideration plus the endodontic status, mm -hmm. there's no PA lesion. Usually it's great. Yeah. So it makes it a very good candidate or good apartment for an FDP. Now another thing to consider is the bony defects. Mm -hmm. Like I said, implant, you need to have good bone. Yes. And the bony defects was so bad that consideration of hard tissue and soft tissue augmentation is going to require a lot of uh, expensive surgery. And after discussing with the patient and all of that, the patient decided not to go ahead with implants. But a soft tissue augmentation was considered to kind of help augment the pontic side. Mm -hmm. So that, because remember the transition line is way beyond the smile, um, it's actually below the smile line. Mm -hmm. So which means to say, I want to give an aesthetic look. So a pontic side development may be indicated in this case. So he was agreeable with a connective tissue graft. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, the patient. So patient is a peril patient. Yes. Let's say in in this case, as you know, the literature has already shown that they are more susceptible and increases the risk of peri-implant like this. So with that, after discussing patient, we decided to go ahead with a four, with a three unit FTP for this yes. case. So the next photo, if you can see, this is an occlusal view, right, of the defect. So you can see the horizontal defect for this patient. And I marked, marked out the ideal bulk for soft tissue to go and give me that good contour. So many authors, of course, have reported success of tissue augmentation um, for horizontal cases like this. You can read papers by Thomas, Zucchelli, Buser and Chen, Ekbali, Hansel. They all report five years relatively stable in connective tissue augmentation. So again, because we're not going to do implants, so there's no need for heart tissue augmentation. Correct. So a soft, ti soft tissue augmentation may suffice in this case. Okay, mm -hmm. so moving on, so this is how a connective tissue looks like. Um, of course, there are many um, factors to consider in terms of graph, mm -hmm. uh, volume of graph, what is the quality and quantity needed. So from this, when you know the quality and quantity, you decide on where the donor site is. Mm -hmm. As for undergrads, I know it's very deep, but it's good to know, yes. right? It gives you options for your patient. Mm -hmm. You can take it from the palate, or you can take it from the tuberosity. But there's a difference. If you think about his toe, right? 
the palette is relatively thin and you don't have very much of tissue bulk so they end up tend to be thin and very much more firm but the volume is less because it becomes a thin sashimi whereas the tuberosity is very thick correct yes. so it become and it's very much softer less firm because it's there's a lot more adipose tissue yes, so if you're going to go for volume you may want to consider the tuberosity yes. however on a side note the palette is easier to harvest mm. you can get yes. a direct vision <laughs> yeah. if you're ready with a seven you try to harvest the tuberosity yeah. it's like a nightmare but of course there are techniques lah. Mm -hmm. okay so moving on this is the post-op uh, after surgery immediately with the sutures and everything in place mm. and so this is the before and after one week post-op so you can definitely see the amount of soft tissue gain from this case with just a palatal connective tissue harvest and this is six weeks post-op for this case um, there's some scarring which is normal you expect of course based on literature they will tell you it takes about approximately about one year for complete healing and all of that maturation so give it some time don't be too alarmed. Um, this is five months provisionals, so you can definitely see the pontic side contours and everything. So for pontic side development, of course, there are many pontic designs. For this case, I decided to go with something called the e-pontic, the aesthetic pontics. Uh, it is a modification from the pon uh, ovate pontic. So you can read by Stephen Liu has a modification of the ovate pontic. You can go read about it. Um, this technique is by Corman. I think the paper was written in twenty fifteen. He talks about the techniques on how to develop it. Mm -hmm. So there are things to look at. So again, this is what we started off with, and this was what I managed. We managed to achieve mm -hmm. with the connective tissue graph. So you can definitely see there is this horizontal augmentation. I see. Okay. So with that, moving on, and this is the final prosthesis where you can definitely see the pontic looks like it's emerging from the from the tissues. But it's actually a pontic, there was no other support. So I actually placed the pontic about approximately about 1.5 mm to 2 mm -hmm. subgingivally. So that gives that nice emergence. I and see. you can really see the soft tissue is very healthy around the side. Mm -hmm. So most importantly is that the soft tissue has to be healthy. Mm -hmm. If it's not happy, it will start to be very angry, it will be red, it will be fiery yeah. red. So these, those are the things to consider right. and to look out for. And this is the outcome of it. And mm -hmm. I mean, it looks quite acceptable. It was a 3 unit FPP. And this is the lateral view. Of course, scarring tissue is still there. This is, I think, seven months post-op from surgery. So do expect still some time for it to totally mature over time. Mm. This is another view. You can definitely see the rope margins. You can even see stippling, which means the tissues are healthy, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah, that's the before and after. Mm -hmm. 12 months post-op review for this case. Uh, okay, doctor. I actually have a question regarding how long did this, since there's a lot of procedures going on, yeah. how long did this whole case actually take you to accomplish? Of course, um, the duration of a case very much depends on what you do, mm -hmm. right? How much is done. In an aesthetic case, when more things are done, they tend to take longer time because you need with maturity of right. soft tissue, right? Yes. So this case, from the very start all the way to the end, it took us approximately about 15 to 17 months oh, but of course the patient was not left without teeth already right? there mean, was provisionals and all it, it's definitely sometimes you cannot rush yes. when you try to rush the case your aesthetic outcome becomes more difficult to control so you want to have full control to get an outcome so the patient has to understand mm -hmm. right yes. so if the patient is not willing then you say I can't yeah you can't expect the moon right so yeah. <laughs> you get them into the whole treatment and and of course with time, people always ask me this question, I mean, just to add on. When do we make the master impression, right? Mm -hmm. After cases like this, how long do we wait? Do we wait three months? Do we wait six months? Do we wait one year? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are literatures out there, you can read uh, Schmidt or Shamar. They all would say, at the end of the day, you need to observe the soft tissue. It, whether a dimensional change is what we don't want. Dimensional stability is what we want to look out for. So once the tissue is stable, that means to say that the tissue is ready for a master impression. It means minimal change will happen. And that takes approximately about six months, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to observe over time. There's no specific time. Okay, five months means I must make impression. No, you have to observe the tissues. I see. Okay, so 
so that means you actually need follow-ups from for like, sure and especially as a para patient right you need yeah. to have close monitoring if it's not they go and come back and respark <laughs> everywhere it's a nightmare yeah. no <laughs> okay so since he had a soft tissue grafting and the bone was okay right the bone was defective for this case. Yeah. That's why implants was not um, an ideal choice. Okay, because uh, I'm curious if it, if the bone is actually defective, will the gingerbread recess over time? Like, if maybe a long time or non patients right. not comply with the right. oral hygiene practices. So we do know what supports soft tissue is bone, right? Yes. If the bone is defective, the soft tissue also will recede together. Mm -hmm. But that's just one part. Mm -hmm. So. Let me break it down into two, um, into two explanations. So right. after tooth extraction, mm -hmm. it is inevitable uh, that dimensional change of avalanche can happen. Correct. And it's more so in the first year itself, based on many literatures. Mm -hmm. You can read uh, by, uh, by Araho, they, they all have this um, reporting and all. So observation of the, of the changes is very important, right? That's why you have the provisionalized phase. Yes. Now for recession, when you do connective tissue grafting, a lot of times people ask how stable is the graft, right? So there's a recent systematic review by Stephen Fackel, 2021. There's also other papers like Akbali and Hammer that talked about the five years uh, stability of connective tissue graft. It shows relatively stable, mm -hmm. right? And you must do note, uh, uh -huh. it's stable because the prosthesis is well contoured. Patient's oral hygiene is well controlled. Yes. <laughs> so you so, so you can when you read the paper, right, you cannot think it as as face front value like that. Correct. There are other considerations to how the case is so well controlled, right? Yes. And recession can happen when if the patient is not compliant in their treatment. Mm -hmm. That's why I say patient is definitely a key patient factor. Compliance. Yes. <laughs> And if, example, mm -hmm. us that this design process is over contoured, lack of embrasure space that is not sensible, right. you're you're in for 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 a nightmare. <laughs> like I said, biology wins at the end of the day. You cannot find biology one. If the biology <laughs> angry, it's gone. <laughs> so patient compliance, biology wins. Yeah, single message. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I have a question regarding the gingival conditioning. Was it actually performed? for this patient? Oh yes, yes, definitely. So, gingival conditioning it was indicated for this case. Mm -hmm. Again, do you remember the horizontal defect that we had, right? Yes. The soft tissue. And right. patient has a high smile line. And I want to ensure that the prosthesis was aesthetic. So the pontic side especially, you know, you want to give it a look to which that it looks like a natural teeth, right? right? With a nice yeah. emergence. So a pontic side development was necessary. Mm -hmm. um, how we did it? Of course, proper planning. Mm -hmm. So when... We had a case we did um, bone sounding. Okay, bone sounding. bone sounding is you have to do it under LA. I don't just poke a patient. <laughs> bone sounding is a point where you, you you measure the amount of soft tissue required. So if you base off literature again, you can read Posey and colleagues. I think the paper was written again in twenty fifteen, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it shows that it was based on a CBCT evaluation on maxilla and mandible. A mean soft tissue height to maintain the health of the uh, of the surrounding periodontium was. Uh, Parent tissues about 2.26 plus minus 0 0.6 mm if I'm not mistaken so with that said right if 2.26 is like the cutoff point mm -hmm. and if I'm going to consider a pontic site development so when it comes to pontic site development you want approximately about 1, point, 1 to 1 1.5 mm into the gingival right to give that nice emergence yes. so if you do the math 2.26 plus 1.5 you need to gain about like 4 ish 5 oh, right yeah. so with that kind of value in my mind I discussed with my peril and we decided to go ahead with the graph and we managed to gain it. So after the augmentation, six weeks after that, mm -hmm. I went in again to do bone sounding. We managed to gain five millimeters, which was ideal. Yeah. Right? So yeah. from there, we made impressions. Mm -hmm. In the lab, I sculpted the pontic, means an approximation to how my pontic shape should be. Mm -hmm. I prepped, provisionalized. So during provisionalization, um, how do I issue this? I actually did a surgical scalping to a point that I can fit my provis in. Then left it in for about five months for maturation. Of course, with um, routine visits back. Then I made the muscle impression. Then I issue. Oh, okay. Very very elaborate, but also very impressive at the same time. Uh, I think I have another question regarding the COVID contact you mentioned just now. The contact use. 
Uh, was there any impression used in the fabrication of the modified plant that you mentioned just now? No, I just used alginate in the very beginning, so I sculpt my ovid based on uh, in, in the lab itself. Mm -hmm. I did a, a PMME uh, pressurized uh, PMME um, mm -hmm. provisionals, and then during master impression, I just did my usual you know heavy light mm -hmm. master impression. I see. Nothing um, additional to it. Keep it simple. Very very stressful. Yeah. <laughs> Um, last, last question regarding the case. Um, well, there is a very wide span between the teeth, the teeth of the patient. And can you maybe explain how you managed to fill up both the mesial and distal side with the bridge? Uh, again, I mentioned this case was quite difficult because if the patient decides not to touch uh, for us to disassemble the tooth 1 1, which is existing crown. Uh, it's impossible honestly to distribute the space again this case was not a very good case for an implant mm -hmm. so i explained to the patient i mean considering all of that mm -hmm. redoing this um, prosthesis is definitely necessary for redistribute the space to achieve the aesthetic results which is desired mm -hmm. so with all of that patient's understanding and informed consent that's how i managed to distribute the space again i mentioned i used a simple um, golden proportion tool with the digital planning mm -hmm. that helped me move it up after I did my wrap up, of course, there was a mock-up phase mm -hmm. where the patient was able to kind of get an end in mind to how he might look mm -hmm. and with the patient's acceptance and all of that, that's how I managed to control the case. I see. Okay. I think that's all the questions I have for the case, but I have one last question. Right. Because you mentioned that um, well, patient, patients are our number one priority also mm -hmm. as um, dentists. So, so when you deal with um, aesthetically demanding patients like the two cases mentioned, and what if there were a case where they were they had certain uh, idea and certain design that they want, but from a professional perspective, it may not seem doable or um, it may not be the best, the most ideal choice from uh, the point of view. How do right. you deal with it? I, I know I get that a lot. I mean, <laughs> I, as a day in day out, you know, we have patients with certain expectations. Sometimes yes. it is. <laughs> unimaginable <laughs> that it's possible so one liner for it is mm. all things are possible but not all things are doable yes I was like a patient that you know I, I can there's a certain limitations to mm. what we can do mm -hmm. if it's not doable I'll just say no cannot it's mm. not possible you can't expect a, a broken piano to be to be fixed overnight and to be perfect again yes not possible so mm -hmm. expectation, trying to ensure that the patient lower the expectations down mm -hmm. is most important. Okay. okay, everything was very, very well put, Doctor. I thank you for your input regarding both the cases and so also <laughs> how to deal with patients who are aesthetically demanding. Uh, we are approaching the end of our session today, but before we end it, I actually have a round of rapid fire questions. Okay. So basically what happens is you have to try to answer questions Almost instantaneously. Okay, I'll try. Okay, I'll try. So, ready when you are. Okay, that's okay. Cool. Okay, so, time starts now. Oh, that's time for uh, <laughs> Within, okay. Okay, so, first question. Would you rather text or talk? Talk. Talk. What is something new happening in your career life right now? New clinic. New clinic. <laughs> Who is your first celebrity crush? Oh, oh I forgot his name. Chris Perry. Chris Perry. <laughs> okay, if you are not a dentist, what would your other career option be? Architect. Architect. Wow. It's very much related to prosthodontics if you if you think about it. If you think about it, in some sense, yes. After <laughs> science. <laughs> okay. Um, would you pour cereal first or milk first in your breakfast? So sorry. Cereal first or milk first? I don't need both. But I'll <gasps> just drink the milk. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I okay. If you answer the question, cereal first. Cereal first. Okay. Um, three words to summarize your journey to becoming a post of this. Love backs up. <laughs> that makes sense. Love backs up. Yeah. Love life? Love backs up. Love backs up. Love backs up. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, what is that song? <laughs> okay, um, what is your pay highest patient record in a day? Mm. I think that was in government. Okay. Oh, in Singapore? I think it was about 20 ish, 30. But 20 30 patients mm -hmm. a day? 20 30 ish. <gasps> wow, okay. Uh, did you struggle as a in prosthodontics in your undergraduate journey? Of course! 
Of course. <laughs> Always. <laughs> All the sleepless nights. Of course. <laughs> Even until today. It's a constant struggle. <laughs> but it's interesting. It's fun. Your passion keeps it. Yes. Go it keeps yes. going. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, last question. In one sentence, what is your advice for undergraduate dental students? Be curious. Be curious. Be curious. Well, uh, thank you for participating. That's the end of our rapid fire questions. Uh, it's been a pleasure to learn uh, so much from you today, Doctor. And so it's very, very fun to interact with you, although I was nodding along most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's not nodding off like. Oh, no, 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 definitely not. Nodding <laughs> and also nodding along. Uh, yeah, to everybody out there, thank you for watching our first ever CPR episode. And do stay tuned for the next one. Thank you.